What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Hidden Forces with me, Dimitri Kafinas. Today, I speak with Daniel Dresner. Dr. Dresner is a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Project on International Order and Strategy at the Brookings Institution and a contributor to the Washington Post. The author of numerous books, his latest, The Ideas Industry, forms the foundation for today's conversation. In this episode, we examine the state of intellectual thought in American society, from the media to academia, from think tanks to TED Talks. The marketplace of ideas is a bazaar full of wonders and witch doctors, hucksters selling snake oil amid the honest shopkeepers and traffickers of good information. How have the foundations of Western intellectual development like empiricism and reason been turned into political footballs? Why has trust eroded to the bone of credibility where journalists are distrusted, scientists discounted, and expertise despised? And how has the growing trend of wealth disparity, partisanship, and information overload created a landscape welcoming to the thought leader, but hostile to the very type of public intellectual that would have been celebrated less than 50 years before? As always, you can gain access to reading lists put together by me ahead of every episode by visiting the show's website at hiddenforcespod.com. Lastly, if you are listening to the show on iTunes or Android, make sure to subscribe. If you like the show, write us a review. And if you want a sneak peek into how the show is made or for special storylines told through pictures and questions, then like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod. And now, let's get right to this week's conversation. So, Dr. Dresner, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. It's actually a pleasure having you on. I'm very excited to have this conversation. I have been covering science and technology for almost, it feels like, you know, the last three months straight with hardly a break. I do these kind of short market forces segments, but for the most part, I've been focused on the sciences and technology, and you know, the social sciences are my forte. It's what I enjoy the most, but I haven't had a chance to really delve into that. So when I came across your work, I mentioned to you in uh, my email to you that I got your name from Robert Johnson, who was a guest on one of our programs. He's the president of INET, and uh, it was uh, a link actually to an article written by someone else citing your book on the ideas industry and the sort of this dichotomy, this duality between public intellectuals, and thought leaders. I have many questions for you, but before we even get to those, how did you get the idea to write a book like this? Where did the thought come from? A couple of different places. Probably the primary one was my move from the University of Chicago to the Fletcher School. The University of Chicago was a very scholarly place. You know, the emphasis there is on making sure that you can uh, publish in peer-reviewed journals and university press books. And that's certainly a component of what Fletcher is interested in as well, but they were also much more interested in public engagement, the idea that I wouldn't just be a scholar, but that I was also supposed to speak to a wider audience, including, among other things, policymakers, which was why Fletcher was a good fit for me. I'd always been interested in doing that. And anyone who goes to graduate school in political science, I think, enters with this sort of idyllic halcyon vision of, oh, I will learn deep things and then I will speak them. And then by speaking them, really important people will hear me. And then I will actually manage to change the world. It's like that maxim that I quoted in the book from John Maynard Keynes about how essentially, you know, madmen and authority are really just repeating the academic scribblings of a century before. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Excellent. Although I always like to note that economists love that <laughs> quote, but they always omit the part where he actually says economists and political philosophers. So he was not just talking about economics. He was talking about... Uh, I love that quote. I have it written exactly. here. I didn't just... I don't just have this great memory. That was actually because I wrote it at the top of this rundown that I have in preparation for our conversation. I ah, absolutely excellent. loved that quote. I think it's apropos that you cited it, but please continue. Right. But so, as I said, as I actually then tried to engage in the mar wider marketplace of ideas, it was interesting to me. I mean, I, I would say I've had some successes. I mean, I've you know, been brought in to, to brief a policy principle about a particular issue where I have an area of expertise. I've written for a wide audience for both foreign policy and the Washington Post. But the marketplace of ideas was clearly changing. And after having done this for a decade, it struck me as something interesting to talk about because in some ways, the explosion of the internet and a variety of platforms had altered things in such a way that I thought it was worth talking about the ways in which the ecosystem had changed. 
And I think it was also triggered by, among other things, the fact that it was unclear what influence. It, it, one of the debates that we always have in political science is how can you measure the effect of our public engagement? This is always a difficult thing to talk about because very often in the policymaking world, if you are an outsider and you let's say you write a useful article or a useful policy proposal, if that'll worm its way into the bureaucracy, but then the bureaucrat is going to take credit for that, which is as it should be, I might add. So it's very difficult to process trace how your ideas potentially get out there. That's something to worry about. And so I realized this was a more complicated story to tell. And then, of course, the 2016 election was another interesting sort of data point where you had an instance in which almost every major foreign policy intellectual that you could think of, both scholarly and non-scholarly, signed petition after petition saying, and regardless of ideological predilections, saying, look, whatever you do, don't elect Donald Trump president. He's going to be a foreign policy disaster. And that didn't seem to have much effect, which was an interesting question, which was to say whether or not this sort of marketplace of ideas really actually mattered. And so I decided I was going to write about it. And this was one of those rare cases for a book. If for any writer listening to this, you know that you know writing a book is always a a labor of love and then a mild amount of hate because you just sort of slog through it. But every once in a while, it's pretty easy. And this book was remarkably easy for me to write. As I started writing it, I realized I'd been thinking about this topic for a lot longer than I had realized consciously. Well, it's interesting. When you were talking about the 2016 campaign, I wrote a number of quotes down. Actually, I have four quotes. Two are from your book and two, I think, are from my own research and thoughts. But it's the one that you have in your concluding chapter by Mark Lilia which has to do with the responsibility of a philosopher who finds himself surrounded by political and intellectual corruption. I sort of had that desire to withdraw from the conversation, but I think it's a significant and important conversation. And so, you know, much of the substance of your book and the relevance of this conversation and the importance of the intellectual in society and in public discourse, I think is a very important subject to cover. So, let's begin sort of by framing the discussion as best as we can for the audience who may not have read your book. I see there are two sort of framings here as I read your book and sort of look through your work. One is this duality, this dichotomy between the public intellectual and the thought leader, and I do want it to get into that. And then the other are these three underlying forces, as you call them, which are driving the, the ideas industry. One is this erosion of trust, which you touched on. Another one is this political polarization that's happened in America. And the third one is growth and income inequality. This economic inequality is something that we've talked about to a great extent on the program from different angles and the way it sort of manifests perversions in society. We have not covered so much the erosion of trust and I don't think at all political polarization. I think these are all very fascinating, but I sort of see these as, yeah, these sort of, these are part of the same uh, pincer movement that's sort of working with each other. I was thinking perhaps we could start sort of defining terms here. I mean, sure. you spent some time in your book chronicling the transformation of intellectual thought in American life since the early 20th century. How would you define the boundaries of what constitutes an intellectual, and where would you start the clock on that in our history? Well, one of the inspirations for the book was another book, which I quote a fair number in, the, in mine, which is Richard Hofstetter's Anti-Intellectualism in American Life. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people tend to have heard of that book without actually having read it and infer that the title basically implies that uh, Americans have always been anti-intellectual. But that's not actually the thesis of his book. The thesis of his book is that, frankly, America's attitudes towards intellectuals have waxed and waned over the years. That in fact, in some ways, the sort of founding fathers, the Puritans, really delighted in intellectual pursuits, but that eventually, inevitably, there's sort of a populist reaction to that in which suddenly intellectuals potentially fall out of favor. So I would argue that you know America's relationship with intellectuals starts, frankly, in the pre-revolutionary era and has continued forward. But in terms of foreign policy, which was the primary area that I was talking about, mostly because that's the area I know best. I sort of imply in the book that I think this applies reasonably well beyond that, but I didn't want to say that with too much confidence because- I will say it absolutely does. Okay. And we'll get into that. And if you're, I'm happy to sort of- I'll let you be my megaphone on that point. Sure, but go ahead. But in terms of the foreign policy world, really, you can argue that the United States foreign policy establishment as we know it, or any in terms of any kind of size, really sort of starts with World War II and its aftermath, the, the Cold War. And basically what I argue in the book is that there are two kinds of intellectuals. And here, I mean people who do not necessarily work in the government, but are clearly trying to write in such a way or articulate ideas in such a way that they will either influence public attitudes about foreign policy or influence elite attitudes about foreign policy. 
And the two styles of intellectuals are called public intellectuals and thought leaders. And in some ways, I'm taking those terms and applying them to an essay that Isaiah Berlin famously wrote called The Hedgehog and the Fox. So in Berlin's reading, the fox is someone who knows a little bit about a lot. And that describes a public intellectual. A public intellectual has expertise in one area. They are often willing to opine on a wide variety of areas, but they are in some ways sort of generalist. They know a little bit about a lot. And what they excel at is being critics. The best thing the public intellectuals can do is tell everyone else what's wrong with their ideas. <laughs> it doesn't make them a very popular member of the cocktail party. Exactly. They're always the person at the cocktail party who says something you know, blunt and truthful, and then suddenly there's that awkward pause for about 10 seconds afterwards, and then everyone <laughs> pretends like the public intellectual didn't say anything. So yes, public intellectuals are not always the most socially- You know this from uh, firsthand experience, I imagine. I'm not saying that that's happened to me, but you know, I can neither confirm nor deny that, but okay. it's a possibility. <laughs> Anyway, thought leaders are evangelists. Thought leaders are hedgehogs. They know one big thing, and they use that big idea to try to explain everything about the world. And in some ways, what they do is anytime you ask a thought leader, well, what's going on in this issue area, they will somehow find a way to bring it back to whatever their big idea is. And thought leaders are also very often experts. There's a tension in the book. And I think many reviewers of the book have concluded that I'm trying to attack thought leaders, and I'm not exactly trying to do that. I'll get to what I'm doing in a little bit later. But the point is, is that thought leaders often generate new ideas. Now, for a marketplace of ideas to thrive, I'm basically arguing that you need a good mix of both public intellectuals and thought leaders. You need thought leaders to constantly inject new ideas, and you need public intellectuals to criticize those ideas to within an inch of their life. If you have a marketplace of ideas that is weighted too heavily in favor of public intellectuals, then the marketplace is stagnant. The barriers to entry are too high. It becomes extremely difficult for anyone to introduce any kind of new idea because the gatekeepers are too powerful. On the other hand, a marketplace of ideas that is dominated by thought leaders and doesn't have enough public intellectuals is a market where the barriers to exit are too high. And by that I mean the problem is, is that new ideas are introduced, there's a lot of heterogeneous conversation, but because there aren't enough public intellectuals, stupid ideas don't die. They just persist, and people continue to believe them. And so that's equally problematic in some ways, if, if particularly if those stupid ideas wind up getting embraced by policymakers. And to go back to the three forces you were talking about, the erosion of trust and authority, the rise of political polarization, and the rise of economic inequality, what I'm basically arguing is that each of these three trends, which you know, are far larger trends than just the marketplace of ideas. These are things that have been going on in the United States for about the last half century. All of them basically stack the deck in favor of thought leaders at the expense of public intellectuals. So if I was writing this book, had I been writing this book in the mid-1960s, I'd probably be more critical of public intellectuals than I would be of thought leaders, or rather the problem with public intellectuals having too much power. As I'm writing in 2017, the problem I'm arguing is that it is much easier to be a thought leader now than it is to be a public intellectual. And the problem is that thought leaders have a tendency to produce a lot of new ideas without ever having them properly or rigorously checked. Well, I want to touch on a few things there. First, you mentioned this goes back to our founding. And in fact, we had the Federalist Papers and Madison, Hamilton, and Jay were very intellectual individuals. And of course, they were also advocates. Just out of curiosity, because that was sort of came to my mind, where would they fall on this? Or would they just simply be outside of the model? Would this not be something that would be a relevant question to ask and to throw them in there? I mean, if I had to say, I would probably put them in the category of public intellectuals, but they are really awesome public intellectuals, I right, guess exactly. the way to put it. I mean, you know, you're talking about one of the aspects of our national history is the idea that the founders were all polymaths in one way or another, you know, Benjamin Franklin or Madison or Jefferson or Hamilton. So it's not surprising that they were obviously pro-Constitution, but you know, they wrote about topics, you know, pretty further and wider than that. So in that sense, you sort of, yeah, I would think of them as sort of the exemplar example of public intellectuals. On the other hand, there were a few thought leaders at the time. I mean, someone like Thomas Paine, for example, I would argue probably was a thought leader because he prioritized the freedom of individuals over sort of uber alles. And as a result, was one of the reasons why he, among others, did not support the Constitution of Memory Service. He thought it was too restrictive. He thought it, it empowered the executive too much. But that said, I will confess a slight degree of discomfort. I'm not sure if my rubric goes so well all the way back to 1776. Yeah. And if his big idea was basically freedom. Again, I, I do think, I think it doesn't really qualify necessarily what I'm getting at there. But all right. So because I do want to ask you a little bit about sort of this ideas audience and 
kind of, you know, some other things about sort of who qualifies, because you have some really interesting tables. You actually list a bunch of intellectuals, and I did want to discuss some of that, but that may be a little nerdy, and maybe we can kind of leave that. <laughs> well, God we... forbid we get nerdy. That would just be <laughs> awful. I mean, we've all sort of seen this, the TED Talk phenomenon, this sort of big yeah. idea thing, the uh, sort of Deepak Chopras or the Mitra Kakus or the Yuval Hararis. And we've also seen all of this amidst these changes in society. One, of course, is this political polarization. I do want to talk a little bit more about this with you. There's someone else who's done, I mean, many people have written about this, but there's someone else who's written a wonderful book called The Righteous Mind, Jonathan Haidt. And he mentions yeah. this phenomenon of disgust that uh, people report feeling disgusted or they uh, express revulsion around certain parties or certain politicians. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a reflection of this widening gap of uh, political polarization. How has this contributed? And also, how are we seeing that manifest? I mean, you have some really sort of standard data in your book that we've seen, things like uh, divergence of voting in along party lines in Congress and the American people and sort of the distrust of government that's steadily declined with, you know, fits and starts since the end of World War II. But how do we think about that? And do you also live in, uh, well, you live in Massachusetts, but maybe from Washington, D.C., like what have you seen? So first on the um, partisanship, yeah, I mean, the data on this is incontrovertible. So if you look at things like congressional votes, it's becoming clear that basically over the last 50 years, the parties have become more ideologically uniform, in which basically Democrats have moved somewhat to the left compared to 1968, and Republicans have moved way, way, way to the right since 1968. And that divide is very clear. It's also clear based on survey evidence that Pew and others have conducted with sort of political elites and party activists on both sides, where that kind of category of individual has also moved further towards the political extremes. The question whether the broad mass public has done this is a little bit more subject to debate. There's some who argue that there's not so much been greater political extremism in the United States, but rather there's been a phenomenon called partisan sorting. One example of this would be, for example, that the South was generally thought of as reliably democratic up until the late 1960s, and that as it turned out, you know, white Southern Democrats were actually Republicans, they just didn't admit to that fact, or Rockefeller Republicans in the Northeast were actually Democrats, they just didn't admit to that ideologically. And as those groups have sorted out, that's part of what's driving this phenomenon. But the fact is, is that even the mass public evidence suggests that at least for the last 20 years or so, there's also been polarization among the wider public. And as you say, one of the effects of this is that essentially political activists on both sides increasingly view the other as almost the enemy, where survey evidence shows that the sort of adjectives used to apply to political elites on the other side are unrelentingly negative. Political activists on one side don't want their children to marry people of a different political persuasion. And indeed, there are ways in which political identity based on survey experiments have actually proven to be more discriminatory than issues of race or gender or sexual orientation. There was one survey experiment that was conducted where different resumes were sent to different employers, and where it was clear if you read the resume, you could tell what their political affiliation was. And it was clear that extreme political human resource people who were nonetheless on one or other extreme side of the political spectrum were more likely to discriminate against resumes that indicated that person came from the opposite side of the political spectrum. I wonder if, uh, sorry to interrupt here, but I wonder yeah. if uh, we would see a similar phenomenon for independents. For example, if someone is apolitical or doesn't really want to bring politics into their uh, organization, if they would discriminate against people that they consider to be political in some way or another. Intuitively, that seems to be true. In the research that I recall reading, I don't think that effect was discovered. Part of it also is that it's very dicey in political science when you say that, see that someone describes themselves as an independent. Sometimes they genuinely are an independent, but very often mm. they say they're an independent, but if you actually figure out what their political preferences are, they're really a Democrat or a Republican. They're mm. just saying they're an independent for some reason or another. But the reason this affects the marketplace of ideas is pretty simple. Most public intellectuals tend to be somewhat heterogeneous or heterodox in terms of their ideas. They might actually say, look, I think, you know, I'm, I'm reliably liberal most of the time, but I think conservatives have a valid point about school choice or about North Korea. Or conservative intellectuals, you know, might say, look, I'm relatively conservative when it comes to market areas, but when it comes to climate change, I do believe that, in fact, the science is real and we have to deal with something about that. Partisans don't like that. Partisans want basically their ideological worldviews to be reaffirmed by their intellectuals. And so a classic example of an intellectual who thrives in this kind of environment is someone like Dinesh D'Souza. 
And Dinesh D'Souza was someone who, you know, back in the early 90s actually wrote a book about politics of higher education. You know, and he's always been a, a pretty strong conservative and affiliated with the Dartmouth Review and with Hoover and with the Reagan White House. But the book was generally critically well received across the board. There, you know, liberal outlets like the New Republic or the Atlantic disagreed with parts of it, but they took it seriously. What is interesting is that since that first book, D'Souza has moved further and further to the right and also, frankly, just become intellectually much sloppier to the point where even sort of respected conservative outlets can't take his book seriously. But what's interesting is that D'Souza himself said that he basically discovered something, you know, around and about the late 90s, which was that the way for him to succeed financially was not necessarily to write to the critics. That's what he was told to do with his first book. But what he figured out very quickly was that there was this yawning thirst among sort of local political elites for arguments that essentially, for intellectual ammunition to bolster what their arguments were. And so he basically started catering to the GOP base. You know, writing books that were more and more absurd, blaming, you know, leftist intellectuals for creating a culture that allowed 9-11 or writing more recent books, you know, about a Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton that really aren't grounded in fact all that much. And these have done relatively well commercially, even though critically they haven't been terribly well received. And, you know, similarly, on the left, you have folks who will make a similar sort of full-throated argument in favor of Bernie Sanders or Jill Stein or what have you. And those are often also well received because these are people that are basically catering to their base. Someone who is a moderate or someone who holds positions across multiple dimensions of the political spectrum will often find it harder to, to talk to these kinds of audiences because these kind of audiences do not want to hear anything that essentially undermines or potentially challenges their political worldview. Where do you attribute that to? Because you mentioned also science before there, and there is this sort of really weird thing that's happened in society that uh, is fairly new, I think. There used to be, certainly I felt it growing up, there was this sort of epistemological consensus around, you know, what we can know and how we can know something or not know something. And empirical models of analysis, science effectively, was seen as sort of the standard method through which we could arrive at consensus around sort of these things that are that we consider facts, traditionally considered facts. But what I've sort of come across and seen is that not only has there been this sort of loss of faith in science on the traditional right, but there's also been this sort of adherence to science as some sort of nebulous idea on the left without really a real understanding of what science is to the point where it almost feels like science has become, you know, some kind of weird, you know, meme or brand and it's lost. Or religion. Exactly. I mean, this notion of I believe in science is, I think, counterintuitive, this idea of believing in science. I mean, science is not something that requires belief. It is a system of, of achieving some level of understanding about the world. You know, I'm curious what you have to say on this front. I've tried to look at the subject, I mean, to the extent that you can even begin to draw a line, you know, I don't know if there is one point, but I look back at sort of McGovern, I look back at the movement that happened within the Democratic Party, neoconservatism, you know, sort of talk radio, cable news, the sort of Southern strategy. I mean, it seems like kind of all these things kind of congealed to create issue-driven politics on the right. And I don't know to what extent the left has participated in this process, but I'm curious, you know, how you view that. So I would say a few things on this. First, while this is a phenomenon, at least with respect to science, that is predominantly on the right, there are examples of this on the left as well. Think about the attitude about GMOs, genetically modified organisms, for example. That's an issue where the science has been pretty solid in saying that the, the externalities to this have been wildly over-exaggerated, but the left is still, you know, insisting that organic the foods are superior and so forth. That's a very interesting point because I think I do imagine that if you were to press most people who support organic or free range or local or whatever the terms are, and I'm not making a statement on this one, one way or the other, but I would imagine that if you were to ask them, they wouldn't have a sort of you know logical foundation for their argument, right. which I think speaks to the point that for the most part, we've always been driven by belief and feeling. Yeah. No, and same, same with homeopathic medicines or, or so on and so forth. But to get back to your more general question, and it, it's true, the, this is also true in social science, as you know, and when I, in the book, I surveyed about 400 sort of columnists and think tank fellows, editors, journalists, and so on and so forth. And what was fascinating to me was that when I asked them whether their confidence in social science had increased or decreased over the last 10 years, 
if they identified themselves as either conservative or libertarian, the response was very clear. They had less faith in social science over the past decade. Um, and that was not true of the liberal respondents. I think there's a couple of things going on here. First, to be entirely fair, there have been episodes where science has reversed itself, where it seems like science said one thing was true and then it turned out something else was true. So I don't know if you're a fan of Woody Allen movies, but my one of my favorite ones is uh, Sleeper. Of course. <laughs> yeah, where, you know, if you recall, he wakes up 200 years in the future <laughs> and finds out, you know, and it, which was a joke in the early 70s, that it turns out, you know, eating eggs and red meat is the best thing for you. And of course, this preceded, you know, a wave of science that actually seemed to make this you know, potentially be the case. So, you know, data about health and, and the best way to, to lose weight and so on and so forth has basically done a complete 180. Well, that's a great example. Sorry to interrupt, but that movement, uh, the cholesterol thing, I mean, there's a great book on this, Good Cholesterol, Bad Cholesterol, and I'm blanking on the name of the author, but he cited sort of the, the travails that Eisenhower endured during the later years of his administration where he had a real, you know, issue with his heart. And mm -hmm. he was being basically starved to death, you know, taking <laughs> cholesterol <laughs> completely out of his that. diet, and it didn't really, yeah. you know, resolve the problem. And there was, no. in fact, this sort of maniacal obsession with cholesterol and fat. And, of course, that's reversed itself. And that speaks to the, I think, what you're really getting to when you talk about this, that it, they've had, science has had it wrong, quote, science, is that the peer review system and uh, the consensus within the scientific community has had it wrong. And there are, of course, politics and uh you know, financial pressures within academia and within the scientific establishment that degrade scientific outcomes. But it's just important to note that the scientific method is something totally different. And I think, you right. know, the, the conflation between those two, I find to be just astounding and challenging to a place well, where- I mean, no, I'll defend the public on this, which is to say, I think you're right that the scientific method is different in and of itself from- scientific results, but but asking the ordinary lay person, there's, there's a concept in political science when we talk about public opinion polling is that we point out that when it comes to politics, for example, most of the public is what we would describe as rationally ignorant. And both of those words count for something. So they're ignorant in the sense that they don't necessarily know that much about public policy issues or political debates going on. But we also point out that it's rational that they don't know that because by and large, most of these things don't affect their daily lives. So, I mean, there might be a long-term impact, but, you know, if you're, you know, working, you know, a $15 an hour job and you're just trying to make ends meet and you're exhausted at the end of the day, you're not going to have time or inclination to watch the news or read a newspaper or what have you. You know, you're going to get little bits and pieces of information from your social media feeds and from maybe glancing at headlines or watching five minutes of news or so forth. But what this means is, is that the public very often does not have that much information, not just about public policy, but also about how science works. You know, particularly if whatever ideas they have comes from, you know, what they learned in high school 20 years earlier. So it's not surprising that, you know, if you have a strong preconceived worldview of how the world works, what you will tend to do is remember those data points that confirm that worldview. So if you're skeptical of science, you will remember the times when science seemingly said one thing and then reversed course. Even though this is an example of the scientific method working, this is an example of, you know, scientific progress showing that, in fact, you know, that the sun does not revolve around the earth, that in fact the earth revolves around the sun, you know, to certain people that'll seem like, see, science is screwed up. So whatever they say now will probably be something different 20 years from now. And it allows people to be skeptical. Would you say that that goes hand in hand with the loss of trust in institutions and experts and that Absolutely. this may be partly due to, to an attitude among the intellectual class that it isn't their job? to convince people. I think that's something that sort of I've thought mm -hmm. on my own, which is that there seems to be this sense and has been this almost, you know, sort of pejorative way to refer to it would be arrogance, intellectual arrogance mm -hmm. that I have authority and you should listen to me. And this is a fact and science says so and blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And people are just like, I'm checking out. I don't care what you say. I'm just going to push mm -hmm. the red button. No, there's no doubt about this. So, I mean, in terms of the erosion of trust and expertise, I think I cited a, a general social survey that looked at sort of trust in what we would call knowledge-based institutions. And the percentage of Americans that had high confidence in those institutions peaked in 1974, I want to say, at about 50%. And by 2012, it was down to 30%. And part of this, I think there's a few reasons for this. Part of this is, again, science has made some mistakes. I mean, in, in the social sciences, think about the papers that have been published recently indicating that replication in psychology experiments turns out 
you know, to generate a low rate of confirmation of pre-existing hypotheses. Could you please explain to our audience why that's so relevant and important? Sure. So there was a study, which is also, by the way, also been challenged, but there was a paper published that basically looked back at something like, I'm probably going to get the number wrong, but I want to say it was something like 200 sort of very well-known, widely cited papers that had conducted psychology experiments. And basically what this project did was they tried to rep, the whole point of experimental method is that you can presumably replicate those experiments and generate similar results. And one of the more disturbing aspects of this paper was that it turned out when they tried to do this, an awful lot of those high, you know, widely cited results were not replicable. And this is in some ways a dagger that goes to the heart of an awful lot of experimental social science. And the reason, just to clarify, I mean, sort of the two sort of most probable reasons for that a mixture of is purposeful deceit in terms of manipulation of data and or unintentional, but ultimately poor shoddy research. Yeah, it was mostly unintentional because sure. my, if memory serves with this paper, an awful lot of these authors that authored the original papers were very cooperative in terms of setting up the replicated studies. There are obviously cases of academic fraud, but this is more a case where it just turned out that no one had bothered to replicate. And so, you know, this was revealed that there were certain limits. So that's one thing. Another thing, and this goes to the point about political polarization, is that one of the easiest ways that conservatives can discredit academics is by arguing that whoever is making this argument, you know, so-called, quote, scientific research, end quote, they can accuse that person of being a liberal elite academic who is out of touch with, you know, the heartland of America. And nine times out of 10, that accusation is going to be accurate in that the academy has shifted pretty far to the left, even as the country has shifted somewhat to the right. And these shifts, you know, are, are reflected in surveys of professors as opposed to the rest of the public, and, and it's been concentrated since 1990. Now, I want to stress that just because the academy has shifted to the left does not mean that the peer-reviewed research that academics do is somehow tainted or flawed. I wouldn't, and I think even those who have conducted the surveys would acknowledge that. But it means two things. First, it is possible that academics don't ask questions that would make you know their liberal assumptions uncomfortable, as it were. And second, it means they're vulnerable to this kind of caricature. So I think this is true of both science and social science. In one of the chapters, I talk about why, for example, in public policy worlds, economists are taken more seriously than political scientists, even though economists have screwed up badly over the last decade, far worse than, than political scientists. And I would argue one of the reasons is that surveys of economists show they are far more middle of the road than political scientists are. And so it becomes tougher for conservatives to label economists as being out of touch lefty academics in a way in which that charge will stick to political science. I actually want to ask you about that because I also I think there's also an interesting dichotomy there as well between quantitative and qualitative and simpler versus complex and sort of bullet point acronym. The interesting thing about the economics versus foreign policy debate, and I think there's only one exception I can imagine really, is Ian Bremmer, who's sort of a thought leader on foreign policy. But you find, mm -hmm. I think, more of those in economics is because the public is so saturated with information that they have become far more receptive towards easily digestible bullet points. That's why acronym mm -hmm. usage has gone up, I think. I mean, it used to be mm -hmm. that you had to read like a DOD paper to see all these acronyms. Now everyone's using acronyms for everything. Everyone's trying to give you a hack on success. You have guys, Tim Ferriss is great, super smart, great stuff, but him, Tim Ferriss, you have this sort of, I mean, him, um, Gary Vaynerchuk, you have these sort of people. You may not even know who these folks are. You may know who Tim is, but... They're yeah, essentially, yeah, so essentially they appeal to this sort of, you've got limited time, here's what you need to know, you know, the five right. facts of the day, you know, business insider, Gawker, you know, I mean, whatever these sort of, these things are. And same That's thing- That's why I TED think, Talks work as well, by the way. The great thing about TED Talks is that well, done well, they are, you know, ideally simple distillations of complex ideas. And yeah, that's a good point. And also, and we should get into that because you do mention TED Talks a lot. And I would like, I have some questions yeah. about that. The other thing mm -hmm. about TED Talks also is that they don't require critical thinking on the part of the audience in the same right. way that it would if you were, let's say, tuning into C-SPAN or watching, mm -hmm. you know, a open uh, sort of on the record conversation at, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Right. But as you would well know, I mean, if you have a choice, you have a choice between watching 15 minutes of C-SPAN or watching a 15-minute TED Talk, I mean, I don't care how sympathetic you are to public intellectuals, almost everyone is going to take that TED I Talk I love, option. listen, you're talking to the wrong guy. You're yeah. talking to the wrong guy. No, and I- I, I used I, I to mean, watch, we, I used to watch, it's yeah. funny, because I mentioned Ian Bremmer. Ian Bremmer mm -hmm. works out at my gym, and I saw him there, and I said, <laughs> I said, are you Ian Bremmer? He goes, yes. And I was like, 
well, I forget what else I asked him, but like he was shocked. He was like, how did you know me? And I was like, I mean, you're Ian Bremmer. I used to watch you at the Nixon Center talk with all these other guys, you know, as part of the National Review, you know, having conversations uh, about, you know, the minutia of policy in Iraq in 2006. And he's like, you know, I went to I've graduate been... school with Ian, so I know him pretty well. Okay. that's Well, it's cool. And he was, uh, it's in so much so that I must say the next time I saw him, I said, Ian, he turned around with the same enthusiastic look. He was excited because he thought it was somebody else, the second person that recognized them. In other words, like, <laughs> yeah, so you're talking to the wrong guy. I mean, I'm a, I love this stuff. I think C-SPAN is amazing, and obviously I'd rather watch 50 minutes of TED Talks than 15 minutes of C-SPAN, but I'd rather watch an hour of C-SPAN than 50 minutes of TED Talks. In other words- That's a better way of thinking about it. That's fair. Yeah, I think that the C-SPAN is more comprehensive. And so I think there's that aspect as well. There's this liturgy sort of evangelizing quality of the TED Talk where you can just kind of get this information. But I, I must say, and I did- notice how even-handed you were attempting to be in your book, and you made some sort of criticisms of TED Talks, granting, of course, that there are great benefits. I must say, this was the first time that I even considered that there might be any negative side to TED Talks. I've found them incredibly useful. No, let me put it this way. Again, one of the advantages of TED Talks, I think, and one of the advantages of the process, as someone who's, who's done at least done a couple of TEDx Talks, is that it does force you to you know hone your ideas in such a way that you can actually reach a general audience. And so that part... You know, I completely agree with, and I, I tend to read criticisms of TED Talks by intellectuals as sort of curmudgeon saying, get off my intellectual lawn. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I certainly don't mean to say that they're totally worthless. But as I, I think I say in the book, I don't just want TED Talks. I want TED Talks with discussants. Essentially, the problem with a TED Talk is, is that you give a version of your idea, it ends with a standing ovation, and... You know, very often you just don't think, well, <laughs> that's what? That's got to be exciting. <laughs> what, yeah, that, that's exciting. That's really great. And it doesn't occur to you, well, why might that idea be wrong? Or what's the problems with these ideas? Sure. And it's particularly true if you're listening to a talk that's outside your area of expertise. And so what I would almost like to see with TED Talks is the 15 minutes and then just add five minutes, five minutes by a discussion who says, OK, this is the part that I really like. This is the part that's the strongest part of the argument. But this is the part where I think the situation is more complex than you are saying. And so that's certainly an area where I do believe that that the problem with TED Talks is that they are perfectly set out for thought leaders, because, again, they're almost ser intellectual sermons, as it were. And sometimes these ideas are incredibly valuable. But you can always be wrong. I want the TED Talk to be falsified, I guess would be the well, way to put it. The best part of these panels at uh, CSIS or CFR are the questions. But I, you know, I wonder whether the audience at, at TED would have the capacity to sort of properly engage in that way, or that, again, it, it may not be the appropriate place. Right. And this is interesting. I have talked to people who have actually done, you know, given TED Talks, and they tell me that the actual conference itself, there is often questions from the audience that they're never filmed. Mm. And of course, there are, you know, events after and before every talk where there's there's a lot more interaction with the audience. And that's certainly valuable, particularly for those people who pay the money to attend. But the problem is, is that you and I, you know, who are only seeing the videos, don't see that part. All we see is the presentation. So that brings up something else, which is TED is a conference, really. And there has been yeah. this explosion of these sort of exclusive conferences that are remarkable. And our audience <laughs> knows that because I've talked about a number of the ones that I attend regularly. I attend one by David Kirkpatrick called Techonomy. And there's uh -huh. another one here. Jim Grant does one at the Plaza once a year, just one day. It's awesome. It's a financial industry conference. And of course, you have Davos and you have these sort of things. Yeah. And I was sort of thinking about this. I should have full disclosure because I just came from a Ditchley Park conference over the weekend. Okay, cool. Well, how was that? <laughs> Actually, it was, as these things go, it was incredibly uh, eye-opening for me. I, I learned a lot. I think this is sort of a movement. You have these all these great conferences that are super educational. That's something that you talk about, which is that you frame it in the context of elites because, in fact, you do have to have a certain salary or you have to be sponsored in order to go to these otherwise expensive events. I was thinking also something else is which you have these traditional organizations that are sort of I guess the traditional intellectual circles of Bilderberg or Bohemian Grove, I know that they're mm -hmm. often sort of you know seen in this conspiratorial light, but mm -hmm. you have these sort of old school, those would probably be more for the intellectuals, right? And right. that's where an intellectual- or, Well, or in foreign policy circles, the Council on Foreign Relations fits that description as well. Sure. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. So I guess that's another question I have in respect to this, which just has to do with education at large. And that's sort of, you know, I created the show in part there's a reason why I read your book. It spoke to me on a number of levels, including in this one, which is I recognize this trend of income and wealth inequality. I mm -hmm. see it, and I recognize that it shifts the paradigm, and it changes the viability of various business models. In other words, mm -hmm. you don't need to be big to be profitable. 
in the same way that you used to. You just have to have the right audience. And so there's also this need at the same time of educating the public and sort of how do you mix those two two things together. So I guess that kind of touches on two points that I want to get to you. One has to do with, you know, how beneficial do you think this sort of has been in general in terms of making this information available? There's also the sort of effect in universities. You know, what has this done to the university environment or is it just really mm-hmm. filling the gap for where universities have uh, fallen behind in terms of relevance and staying up to date with technology? And there was another one, but it slipped my mind. Uh, I'll let you talk to those two and then I'll see if I can remember it. Okay, so I'll answer the second question first because I've forgotten the first one. So, but, but the <laughs> question about universities much. in terms of the challenge that they face in this environment, there's no denying that universities face a, a more difficult challenge for a couple of reasons. First of all, again, the sort of trust in universities has gone down significantly. You know, again, you take a look at Gallup or any other survey, trust in every major social institution in the United States, with the exception of the military, has declined significantly over the last 50 years. Universities are no exception, and in no small part, the problem that universities face is simply they charge so much for tuition that it's actually changed the relationship between universities, students, and more importantly, the parents of those students, who are often the ones shelling out the money. So they want to make sure that you know their student is getting their money's worth and also is being treated as a customer rather potentially than a student. And those two relationships are often in tension. You mentioned Jonathan Haidt, and one of the things that Haidt also wrote or co-authored was a cover story in The Atlantic talking about the coddling of the American mind, in which he argues, among other things, that, that essentially universities have basically created this cocoon for their students. And as a result, it means the students are somehow more intellectually fragile. Although what's interesting is that there was also a different book that came out roughly around the same time by William Derisowitz called Excellent Sheep, arguing that the problem with the universities is that they were too neoliberal, that all they're doing are factories trying to transform students into well-trained workers who can join the labor force. And I would gently suggest that these two criticisms are in conflict, but it's one of the things... Yeah, very much so. (laughs) But one of the challenges that universities face is that they are getting criticism from both conservatives. That's longstanding. But now they're also getting it from liberals. And so they're in some ways they're fighting a war on college on, on two fronts. I mean, that's potentially challenging. The other issue is that universities are having a or experiencing a more difficult or fraught relationship with philanthropists. You know, a lot of universities at the elite level have some degree of autonomy precisely because they have large endowments and because a large part of their budget will come from their endowment income. But that means they need alumni to constantly give money to sustain that kind of capital base. But increasingly, what you're seeing with the wealthy is that they have this, they've become philanthrocapitalists, which means to say that they want to donate large amounts of money, but they want to get results for that money in the same way that they want results for their money in the private sector. And this means they tend to be a little more hands-on with their donations, but there's a fundamental tension with doing that and the idea of the freedom of inquiry within universities. So they might be perfectly willing to donate money to a university, but they want to direct where that money should go. And there are times where universities are going to be have to resist that impulse because it degrades the relationship and degrades their reputation for intellectual autonomy. So that's a pretty big challenge. And it leads philanthropic capitalists very often to wind up redirecting their money towards, let's say, their own startup think tank or towards what they would call a do tank or funding more private sector research or what have you. And I can't remember what your other question was. I'm sorry. It's okay. I remember what the, the one I hadn't remembered. is. Uh, oh, so okay. it's interesting. I call philanthropic capitalists benefactors with benefits. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that line. Yeah, actually, I, I, came, I came up with that up. as I was writing my notes. But, you know, there is one benefactor with benefits who you either know personally or you know through your work, which is Jeff Bezos, who has purchased the Washington <laughs> Post. You write for the Washington Post. What has I do, been I do your... not know Jeff personally, though. No, well, not many people do, so I haven't been impressed. Yeah. I threw that out there in case. You never know. But, you know, how? what has been your experience? I've heard good things on par in terms of, although I must say their coverage has, it clearly, it's hard not to be part partisan insofar as like to be seen as partisan in this political climate. I must say that's another thing because the Washington Post clearly has a leftist leaning in its coverage of the Trump administration. But at the same time, it's hard to know how you would not be perceived as taking a partisan stance in this such vitriolic climate. 
But I'm curious sort of, you know, what your experience is working at the Post. And uh, I've heard a number of really amazing things that Jeff is doing in terms of like revamping the paper, in terms of really Mm -hmm. trying to leverage Amazon as only really he can and the prime membership and sort of the digital savvy of his team. What have you uh, experienced? All right. So first, I will push back on the notion of the Post as being a, a sort of lefty publication. I would argue that the news coverage of the Post is about as nonpartisan as you can get. And in that mm. sense, Marty Baron, I think, has done a, a fabulous job as editor. I write for the opinion section, obviously, and that's a different story. And you can make the inference, you whatever inference you want, although I would point out we have a fair number of conservatives who write for the Post. In terms of, of what Bezos has done, in some ways he represents the exemplar, and this is going to sound like sucking up, but it is true based on my own experiences. I would argue that Bezos represents the exemplar of what a philanthropist would do to a newspaper, which is to say, you know, Bezos made it very clear from day one when he took over that he was not going to talk at all about the content, the news content of the Post, that, you know, there was going to be a, a strict wall between editorial and news coverage. And I think the other thing Bezos did that was incredibly smart and is a contrast with, let's say, Chris Hughes, who I talked about in the book when he took over the New Republic, is that Bezos knew what he didn't know, which is to say that the parts where he intervened in the post were the parts where he actually knew a great deal, which was namely how to market its digital content. Mm. And so, as you say, the relationship between the post and Amazon or making the post, you know, post reports and columns sort of syndicated so that local newspapers elsewhere could share absolutely helped the post. And also basically just ramping up the the digital and video teams. One of the few things I did for the post that that truly went viral was a collaborative project with uh, Alyssa Rosenberg and and Sonny Bunch, where we, before the Star Wars The Force Awakens came out, we did a sort of mock-up of how Ken Burns would talk about Star Wars. And so it was sort of a a cross between Star Wars and and his Civil War documentary. I was going to say, did you hear that it turns out uh, Princess Leia had a PhD? Did you hear this? I blogged about it. I wrote about that. Oh, oh yes. you wrote? That, that okay, awesome. so maybe I, <laughs> I saw that. Oh, no, I so, heard about that. That was definitely oh, uh, right. That's you. That. You wrote that because you were nerding out on vacation, you said, right? That was your Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, fascinating. But, you know, <laughs> right. So this kind of thing, they set up the video. You know, we, we did a, a documentary style thing of about four minutes. You know, it went massively viral. Mark Zuckerberg had watched it. He said he loved it. Ken Burns watched it. He said he loved it. And I think the Wall Street Journal had a story showing this as an example of encouraging this kind of innovation, you know, at the at the ground level, you know, that basically did a good job of promoting the Post brand. I would say the biggest thing Jeff Bezos brought to the Post, though, to be honest, was in some ways in both the reporting floor and, and in, you know, the opinion side, was just a confidence that the Post was going to endure, was the notion that, okay, someone has our back, we can write what we want to write, and we're not going to worry that somehow one or two stories is going to somehow deep six the post. And indeed, one of the things I've been amused by with Donald Trump going after Bezos is that I think his nickname for the post is easily his worst nickname ever. You know, calling us the Amazon Washington Post. Who calls you that? Compliment. Is that Trump? Trump calls yeah, you Trump that? Yeah, Trump likes to talk about the Amazon Washington Post. And, you know, I don't know how anyone's supposed to cover that administration. I think Robert Costa over at the Washington Post did a tremendous job. In fact, after right. I made my point about left leaning, I thought about Costa's Costa, coverage. Costa, yeah, no, I th- or I think David Weigel. Yeah, I think he's he's done such a remarkable job towing that line. I tend never right. to sort of get involved in the sort of palace intrigue of politics. Mm-hmm. I am very much an example of someone who has switched off, and I found it, I must say, the other thing that I found extremely challenging in this environment is how do you contribute effectively if you genuinely care and you want to mm-hmm. make a difference insofar as moving the needle in a positive direction, wherever that is, how do you get involved in this vitriolic climate without being perceived as being biased and having an agenda. And I think that's extremely difficult. And I think that speaks to your sort of this battle, this dichotomy, this push and pull Mm -hmm. between the intellectual and the thought leader, which is why one of the reasons I was so attracted in your work is because I do think, I agree with you, I do think we need more intellectuals and we need more people that the public can simply sort of trust in a way, again, because I think that Mm -hmm. That's fundamentally a problem because the public is not going to be able to go into the data and understand the models and, you know, sort of look at the the formula used to conduct this experiment and how many subjects did you have in this study and X, Y, Z and make a determination. No one can do that regardless of how intelligent they are. They don't have the time. And so that, I think, leads us to sort of solutions. And, you know, what do you think the solution is to this situation we find ourselves in? 
Right. Well, this is the tricky part of the book because in some ways I'm saying that the problem with the marketplace of ideas are these big macro forces of the erosion of trust of institutions and rise of political polarization and rise of wealth inequality. And so all we have to do is just reverse these three big macro forces and everything will work out. But, you know, I'm a political scientist and I can't just, you know, snap my fingers and say, okay, all you got to do is reverse those three trends. There are a few smaller bore things that I think can be done. One which I talk about is relying on a greater diversity of intellectuals, both in terms of gender and religion and race. Not that that's necessarily going to produce a more heterogeneous conversation, but it cuts against what I talk about in the book, which is the superstar phenomenon. You know, I should say something. I just wanted to interrupt because I've noticed something. I've noticed that on TED Talks, because we were talking about TED Talks before, I find that mm -hmm. in the cases where minorities or women are put on, more often than not, the conversations they're asked to have or that they are brought on to have are conversations that are gender specific or right. almost sort of stick them in a box. I think that's quite unfortunate. And I think that's a big problem that we have. That goes back to this sort of political correctness and everything else. It's this thing that almost like we're doing it wrong. We're finding the wrong ways to have to it should be that if you're a scientist, you're a scientist, whether you're a woman or a man, and you can talk about quantum mechanics or you can talk about gene editing. You don't have to talk about, I mean, I, I've actually written down a bunch of these titles for TED Talks that I've seen. I don't have mm -hmm. them with me here, but I mean, some outrageous titles for talks given by minorities or by women. But yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there because I've actually noticed that empirically. I've actually gone through TED's videos and I've seen it. The other thing I would recommend is that so the more traditional foundations, which, are, you know, back during the heydays of the Cold War, sort of Ford Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, used to be some of the primary funders of a lot of the sort of public intellectual output. And I would argue they've become prisoners to some extent of the management consultants of the world where they are now so obsessed with impact that they wind up, you know, being reluctant to give money to uh, scholarship or to public intellectuals unless they see an immediate, like, you know, impact on, in the next quarter or so forth. And so they need to have a little more patience on this front. And this is also, I think, a you know, potential way in which you can diversify sources of funding, which makes it easier for public intellectuals to sort of carve out a living being critics rather than, than just generating ideas that the tech entrepreneurs want to hear. And then the last thing, and this might be the weakest read, but I, it is one that I think is important, is that intellectuals themselves need to be able to self-discipline. And one of the hopes I have with this book is by basically pointing out to intellectuals that maybe, you know, the shift in material incentives is changing the way in which we engage the public, and that's not necessarily a good thing, would actually make people a little more self-conscious about, you know, accepting the more ethically questionable assignments or writing gigs or speaking fees. You know, in theory, one of the things that should make intellectuals stand out is that income maximization should not necessarily be the primary goal we have. We certainly want to make money. There's nothing wrong with that. But presumably, we also want to actually, you know, have some degree of self-respect. We want the ideas to be able to live on their own. And so the concluding chapter, the title of it is The Dark Knight Theory of the Ideas Industry, because I'm quoting a line from Harvey Dent in The Dark Knight, where he says, you know, you either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. I would like all intellectuals to not die. I want them to live long lives, but I don't want them to become the villain. So I guess, let me ask you this with respect to sort of what you're talking about in terms of solutions. Have you looked at the problem of the intermediation of technology and how that has had an effect on uh, sort of the quality of the ideas that are out there? Is that something that you've considered at all? There's some people like Tristan Harris, for example, who's recently come out of Google engineer, design ethicist, essentially, looking at some of sort of the technological solutions that can help drive quality over, you know, low quality material like cat videos or whatever, as often happens with Facebook in the way that they prime their algorithm. So I would say two things on this. The first is that I'm somewhat skeptical of technological solutions to deeper social problems. You know, what I'm describing is the way that people are hardwired. I am, and in the ways in which sort of deeper socio-cultural trends are affecting the way we think about ideas. I think anyone who thinks there's a technological fix to this is actually suffering from something that I criticize in the book, which is the Silicon Valley attitude to politics, in which, you know, and I've talked to a lot of the, the sort of entrepreneurs on this, where they think of politics as this piece of faulty code that somehow needs to be hacked or bypassed as a way of achieving what they want. And there are occasions or, or situations where that might be the case, but there are a lot more where, in fact, no, this is 
way that we do politics. And you need to actually get down into the muck and, and figure out the art of compromise. And so, But you don't think that Facebook and Twitter have had a noticeably negative effect in some significant ways? No, I think the jury is out on this. I think they have had an effect, but I would argue that public intellectuals have been almost as successful in terms of using tech as thought leaders have. That's interesting. I've actually, I think my sense would be the, the opposite. I've found that uh, the way in which we engage with information has been diluted in some significant ways. I think the early internet and the early incarnations of the platforms was effective, but as the platforms went to monetize their audiences, it changed a bit. So, Dr. Dresden, I know we got to wrap up. I did want to ask you mm-hmm. some questions on foreign policy, but we, we won't be able to get to them. We just sort of stuck the meat of your book. Thank you so much for coming on the program, and I know our audience will really appreciate this conversation. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And that was my episode with Daniel Dresner. I want to thank Dr. Dresner for being on my program. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Strianos Nicolaou. Sound engineering was Ignacio Lecumberi. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforcespod.com. Join the conversation through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at hiddenforcespod or send me an email at dk at hiddenforcespod.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.